So when Ray and I crossed the plate with the winning run in the iconic Game 6 of the 86 World Series that eventually led the Mets to win it all in Game 7 after the Red Sox were literally one strike away from winning the title just moments before, the guy who ended up scoring that came to the Mets through different machinations. Were it not for Johnny Bench wanting to play third base, he would never have been traded from Cincinnati, and uh, he would have never ended up in New York uh, the, the first place. He was kind of, not say uh, used in Houston, but they got rid of him as well. And here he was some seven or eight years after. He was a key cog to the red last aspects of the Reds' big red machine. He was, he was an international sensation. Ray Knight. Now, Charles Ray Knight, born Albany, Georgia, is a former MLB infielder best remembered for his time with the Reds and the Mets. Originally drafted by the Reds in the 10th round of the 70 Major League Baseball Draft. Again, he's best remembered to Reds fans as he's the man who replaced Pete Rose at third base. Whereas Mets fans remember Knight as the man who scored a winning run in Game 6 of the 86 World Series. And he was also the series MVP. He was most recently a studio analyst and occasional game analyst for Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. <coughs> Coverage of the former Montreal Expos, the, the Washington Nationals, from 07 to 18. Now, he grew up in Albany and attended a Daughtry High School and Albany Junior College. Now, he made his Major League debut as a call-up uh, in, in 1974. Unfortunately, uh, that cup of coffee didn't last uh, that long. He spent all of 75 and 76 with a triple A Indianapolis Indians. In 76, with only one home run coming in the final month of the season, he borrowed a bat from Red Star George Foster and hit nine in the remaining games of the year, which probably saved his minor league career. He would later borrow Foster's bat again in the major leagues when Foster was injured. During those seasons, the Reds won two World Series titles, but he uh, didn't get his ring like the others did. He returned to the majors in 77. Now, Knight was a 232 hitter with two home runs and 19 runs batted in when he assumed the role of starting third baseman for the Big Red Machine following Rose's signing with the Phillies in 79. Knight responded with a 318 batting average, 10 home runs, 79 RBIs, and 64 runs scored. He was a media darling as well as, he, as they voted him fifth in the National League MVP voting. Now, on May 13, 1980, he broke out of a 0 for 15 slump by homering twice in the fifth inning of a 15-4 win over the Mets. He was the first Red to hit two runs in one inning, but Aaron Boone matched that feat in 2002. He made his first All-Star appearance in 1980, hitting a single off former Dodger and future Yankee Tommy John in his uh, first at-bat. Now in 81, Knight batted 259 with six home runs and 34 RBIs. On December 18, 81, he was eventually traded to Houston Astros for Cesar Cedeno to accommodate Johnny Bench's move from behind the plate to the third base to help extend his career. And of course, that was a bad trade because Bench only played two more years. Now, he split his time between third and first with the Astros. He made the All-Star team in 1982 and played third base in the game. However, he made more appearances at first than he did at third during a regular campaign. Now, again, a strong season at the bat in the 83, 3-4 average. Unfortunately, he was batting only 237-84 when he was traded two days after my birthday, August 28-84, to the Mets for three players to be named later. Gerald Young, Manuel Lee, and Mitch Cook, of course, Manny Lee, future with the Blue Jays. Now, Knight platoon at third, third base with a newly acquired Howard, Howard Johnson, no relation to the hotel, for the 85-86 seasons. In his first full year with the Mets, he batted only 218 with six home runs and 36 RBIs. During the offseason, the Mets attempted to trade Knight to the Pittsburgh Pirates to get back Lee Mazzilli, but were denied. Now, Knight changed his uh, career heavily in 86 when he adopted a new batting stance and saw immediate results, crushing six home runs and batting 306 with 12 RBIs in the month of April. Teammate Ron Darling spoke highly of Knight's contributions in a midseason interview. Besides our pitching, it has been Ray Knight's emergence that have been the difference. He carried us for a long time. Now, I watched two games that season back-to-back -back against the Expos, and he seemed to be a type of person would take advantage of not, say, poor pitching, but mediocre pitching in key situations. And this is the year where the Mets couldn't lose at home or on the road. Now, ironically, on July 22nd, he incited a bench-clearing brawl at Riverfront against his former teammates. Eric Davis was pinch-running for Reds player manager Pete Rose in a tent. 
when he stole second and third. Knight took the throw for Mets catcher Gary Carter late, brought his glove to Davis's face, and knocked his helmet off. A stare-off ensued, followed by a right cross from Knight. The benches eventually emptied, and as a result of the ejections for this fight, along with Daryl Strawberry had previously been ejected for arguing balls and strikes, backup catcher Ed Hearn was brought into the game, and Carter moved from behind to plate the third. The Mets won the game in 14 innings. Now, 108 victories in 86, and he took the National League convincingly by 21 and a half games over the Phillies. For the season, he had batted 298, 11 home runs, and 76 RBIs to earn NL Comeback Player of the Year honors. Knight, unfortunately, only batted 167 in the 86 NLCS as his former teammates, the Astros. In the World Series, however, Knight broke out big time with a 391 batting average and five RBIs. Now, the Mets won the 86 World Series in seven games against the Red Sox. Knight's key single in the 10th inning of Game 6 of the series drove in Gary Carter, who uh, had uh, singled with two outs to extend the inning, and this was the first run of the inning. This also pushed Kevin Mitchell to third, allowing him to score on Bob Stanley's wild pitch. Knight then scored a winning run from second after Mookie Wilson's ground ball went through the legs of Bill Buckner. And Knight's celebration as he rounded a third in to score was one of the most uh, indelible images of the series. Like he was grabbing his helmet like, what the hell happened? He hit the tie-breaking home run in Game 7. It was awarded a World Series MVP and the Baseball Writers Association of America's Babe Ruth Award for the best perf in the World Series. Now, ironically, the offseason, they were looking to revise the team for, for money-wise, and the Mets management uh, weren't going to keep him for some reason. Unable to agree on a contract with Frank Cashin, the GM, for 87, he became the first player to join a new team a season after winning the World Series MVP, signing with the Orioles. The Orioles finished 6th in the AL East in 87, narrowly avoiding 100 losses with 95. For his own part, Knight batted 256 with 64 RBIs and tied his career high with 14 home runs. Following the season, he was traded to the Tigers for pitcher Mark Thurmond. Knight served primarily as the Tigers' first baseman, or DH, though he did see some playing time at third in the outfield. He batted only 217 that year with three homers and retired at the end of the season. So 13 seasons. 1,311 hits and 4,829 at bats, 84 homers, 595 RBIs, 14 stolen bases, and a career 271 average. Now, retiring from baseball, he became an ESPN announcer. He accepted his first coaching job with the Reds in 93. Early in the 95 season, Reds owner Mark Schott, who really uh, favored uh, Ray Knight quite a bit, announced that he would replace Davey Johnson as manager of Reds in 96, regardless of how the Reds did. Schott and Johnson had never gotten along, and relations between the two had deteriorated to the point that she was almost, almost fired Johnson after the 94 season. However, the Reds were doing so well under Johnson, they led the NL Central at the time of the 94 Major League Baseball strike and won the division in 95. Then she instead opted to name Knight as AM, or assistant manager, with the understanding they would succeed Johnson in 96. Now, when he imagined the Reds from 96 to 97, he also served as acting manager for a single game in 2003. In, 80, in 87, 97, ironically, he made a mental boo-boo. He forgot how many outs there had been in a half inning which the Reds were at bat and called for a bunt at an inopportune time. He later fined himself 250 for the incident. The team's lack of success would lead to his firing midway through the 97 season in favor of Jack McKean. Now from 07 to 18, he was a broadcaster with the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network, Masson, and co-hosted Nats Extra, Masson's pre-game and post-game show for its Washington Nationals broadcast. Johnny Holiday, Knight's fellow Masson broadcaster and Nats Extra co-host, playfully referred to him as the Silver Fox. Again, Knight was one, uh, one of several members of the 86 Championship team not to attend the 29th anniversary celebration at Shea in 2006. The others included Davey Johnson, who was managing Team USA in Cuba, Dwight Gooden, who was in jail, Roger McDowell, who was the Atlanta Braves pitching coach at the time, Lou Lee Mazzelli, who was the uh, uh, New York uh, Yankees bench coach at the time, and p- pitching coach Mel Stolmeyer. Knight's absence was due to him stating at a previous commitment. Now, his personal life was, was big news because when you marry probably the best female athlete in the world, people's going to take notice. He, uh, he married LPJ championship golfer Nancy Lopez on October 25, 82 in Pelham, Georgia, the wedding second for both was at the home of his partner in a film uh, sporting goods store. 
Knighton and Lopez met by chance in Corey Kun Stadium in Tokyo in 78. He and Lopez eventually had three daughters together, Ashley Marie, Aaron Shea, and Tori Heather Knight. He lived in Albany, Georgia, and also had a home in the Villages, Florida. Lopez designed her first golf course for the Villages, and the tree nines of the 27-hole Lopez Legacy Course are named for the daughters, Ashley Meadows, Meadows Tor Tori Pines, and Aaron Glenn. In 85, he had a seven handicap in golf and some, sometimes caddy for her, but not in big tournaments. Knight and Lopez unfortunately divorced in 2009. A son from his first marriage, uh, Brooks Knight, passed away in 2022. Now, in 2013, Phoebe Putney Hospital in Albany, Georgia, unveiled a street on the property named Ray Knight Way. Very beautiful. <laughs> Knight is also good friends with former Red teammate Harry Spillman, who will be featuring on the channel very soon, who grew up 20 minutes away from Knight in Georgia. While they were aboard in the Red System, the two spent $700 on a pitching machine to work under hitting. Knight is also a member of the Golden Gloves Boxing Association. Now, he made the news again in 2017 when he was arrested after an allocation at his condo in the Alexandria, Virginia area with an unidentified 33-year-old man. Both were taken to the hospital and Knight was charged with assault and battery. The charges were subsequently dropped. Now, Knight also participated in the 2021 ESPN 30 for 30 documentary series about the 86 New York Mets season, one upon, Once Upon a Time in Queens. Now, uh, the, the idea about Ray Knight, he was destined to be a starter with Cincinnati, but he, he, someone had to move, Pete Rose or Bench or whatever. But that first season, again, only hit 182. Best campaign, in, in my personal opinion, was in a championship division year of 79, 10 home runs, 79 RBIs, with a 318 batting average. So he would get you RBIs, he would, uh, he would hit for power, he was always doing something uh, for the squad the best way he could. Now, uh, uh, 86 again, 11, 76, 298. Cash and I think didn't want to pay him what he was worth, and he figured he's going to want, uh, you know, uh, millions and millions of dollars and uh, as an MVP you can't not give it to him so he basically you know he left he left it he's on, on his own accord so ladies and gentlemen baseball is a funny is a funny game now at the time he was getting 645,000 with the Mets in 86 the two who took a pay cut to play with the Orioles so I mean uh, you can figure that out he would have got a three year three million dollar contract probably so, ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, thank you for the support of the Big Red Machine uh, podcast. We really enjoy uh, doing it for you and your uh, your responses. Don't forget, there's a lot of people out there in Canada that are Reds fans. So, if you're wondering how come we're doing a lot on the Reds, it is getting close to the the anniversary of 75-76. We've got 11 months to go of the, the 15th anniversary of the official best years of the Big Red Machine. So, consider this 11 months ahead. So if you want to listen to The Big Red Machine in the anniversary year, you're going to have all these podcasts to listen to. So that's the story of The Legend of Ray Knight. If you like what we're doing here again, give us a like, comment, subscribe, or share. And if you like what we're doing, tell your friends. If you don't like what we're doing, don't tell nobody. Have a good one. Bye.